James, a servant of God and of the Lord Jesus Christ, to the twelve tribes in the dispersion, greetings. Every good gift and every perfect gift is from above, coming down from the Father of lights, with whom there is no variation or shadow due to change. Of his own will he brought us forth by the word of truth, that we should be a kind of first fruits of his creatures. You may be seated. Thank you. As we get seated, let me pray for us. Father, we praise you for every good gift and every perfect gift comes from you. And we pray now as we all gather around the gift of your word that you would make your word live to us and to the kids downstairs. And this season, even as we, we've seen this video of the youth ministry, we do pray for our youth. Um, and in particular, we pray for uh, the youth and university and college students who have graduated from high school and from university and college, Lord God. In this season of change, I pray that even as they praise you for how your faithfulness in bringing them thus far, that you would continue to be their rock and their anchor as in the midst of transition as they seek your face moving forward. In your name we pray. Amen. Well, good morning. My name is Sam. I'm one of the team here. Before we get started, just to say that um, if you want a bit physical Bible to refer to, we have a couple of Bibles at the Connect table. There's a table at the far corner back there which you can grab and borrow for the gathering. And if you're new to Christianity, you don't have a Bible of your own, why not take one home uh, for yourself? That's our gift to you. We would love for you to have that. So today we're kicking off our summer sermon series in the book of James. And usually in the first of any sermon series, we, we start by trying to answer the question, why? Why this book? Why now? Why do we think it's something that we need to hear as a church? But today we're kicking off our sermon series with a different question. Not the question of why, but the question of who. Because in the book of James, the question um, the question who is, is, understand, is key to understanding the question of why. And so the two points that we have for today are focusing on answering the question of who. Who James was and who we can be. Who James was and who we can be. And so to our first point, and just so you know, we're going to be spending most of our time in this point. Who James was. James begins the letter the way most letters begin, by telling us who he was. But here's the thing, isn't it? He doesn't give us many details about who he was. Look at verse 1 again. James, a servant of God and of the Lord Jesus Christ. James, just James. James was evidently so confident that his readers knew who he was that he didn't feel the need to give more details of who he was. No other details identifying who this James was other than that he was a servant of God. Now, now the, the lack of identifying details have led scholars to speculate which James in history this James was. But the consensus now is that this James, the James who wrote this letter, was one of Jesus' brothers. The same James that Paul talks about in Galatians 1 verse 19. Let's look at that. Paul writes this, but I saw none of the other apostles except James, the Lord's brother. And that James, the James that Paul writes about, the Lord's brother James, he needed no introduction because everyone knew who that James was. He was one of the leaders of the church, one of the pillars, one of the key decision makers. Let's look at some passages that explain James's role in the church. Galatians 2 verse 9, look at how Paul writes about James and the role James had to play in commissioning Paul for his own ministry, 2 verse 9. And when James and Cephas and John, who seemed to be pillars, perceived the grace that was given to me, they gave the right hand of fellowship to Barnabas and me that we should go to the Gentiles. James is one of the pillars of the church, says Paul, one of those instrumental in commissioning Paul for his ministry. And in fact, so important was James as the leader of the church that when Peter, who, who Paul refers to as Cephas, is miraculously saved from prison, he asks that James be one of the first people to be notified, Acts 12 verse 17. Acts 12 17. But motioning to them with his hand to be silent, he described to them how the Lord had brought him out of the prison. And he said, tell these to James and to the brothers. 
And then a few chapters later, when there was a major theological discussion at this big meeting that we now know as the Jerusalem Council, Acts 15.13 tells us James was the one who had the final word. One of the pillars of the church, one of the first ones to be notified when something major happened, the one who had the final word when it came to something, a discussion instrumental to the church. The point is this, James needed no further introduction because everyone knew who he was. He was one of the key leaders of the church, the one everyone looked up to, the one whose counsel everyone depended on. But that's not all of who James was. Before James was the leader of the church, in fact, before he followed Jesus, he was a very different person. Far from leading people to Jesus, in his earlier years, James actually sought to do his very best to lead people away from Jesus. Far from following Jesus, James was someone who very publicly rejected and opposed Jesus and said some pretty terrible things about Jesus. And we know that today, and they knew it back then. It wasn't a secret. Everyone knew about it. The Bible tells us that as Jesus started his public ministry, there was real tension in Jesus' family as James and other members of Jesus' family were caught up in the attention and the controversy that Jesus was attracting. And so James and the rest of Jesus' family, they, they reacted by publicly rejecting Jesus and even trying to undermine Jesus. Mark 3 verse 20. Then Jesus went home, and the crowd gathered again, so they could not even eat. And when his family heard it, they went out to seize him, for they were saying, He is out of his mind. Jesus, oi, Jesus, big brother, stop drawing attention to us. Don't you know you are embarrassing us? Don't listen to him. He doesn't know what he's talking about. You know, things are really bad when the family starts to air their dirty laundry for everyone to hear and to see. And that's exactly what was happening. The tension and the resentment had been building and building and building, and now it's spilling out everywhere. James and the rest of Jesus' family, they physically try to seize Jesus and pull him away and tell everyone, don't listen to him, he's out of his mind. John summarizes it in John 7 verse 5. For not even Jesus' brothers believed in him. The James who writes the letter was a leader of the church, but he was also someone with a dark past. Before he was a distinguished leader of the church that everyone looked up to, James was someone who rejected and resented Jesus, who had said and done some pretty horrible things that would have made anyone cringe. It's one thing to treat your brother badly. It's another thing to treat your brother badly who turned out to be God. (laughs) Talk about family baggage. And it's another thing for everyone to know about it. Before we go on, we need to notice a few things here. Firstly, talking about who James was and the conflict in Jesus' family reminds us of how much ordinary human life Jesus experienced and can therefore empathize with us with. I think often we don't realize that, do we? Or we forget about it. Jesus was God, but Jesus was also human, and therefore Jesus also had a human family. So while Jesus was perfect, he was surrounded by imperfect family members. And so Jesus' family, much like all our families, had tension and misunderstandings and drama and conflict. Before Jesus started his public ministry, he had a very ordinary job as a carpenter. Jesus had to do ordinary jobs. He got hungry, he got thirsty, he got tired. Sometimes he just needed to get away. He had family drama. So ordinary was Jesus' life growing up that when he starts to lift the curtain on who he actually was, when he starts to teach everyone who he truly was, no one believed him. In fact, they were offended as someone so ordinary who claimed to be someone so extraordinary. Look at Mark 6, uh, 6, Mark 6 1. 
Jesus went away from there and came to his hometown, and his disciples followed him. And on the Sabbath, he began to teach in the synagogue, and many who heard him were astonished, saying, where did this man get these things? What is the wisdom given to him? How are such mighty works done by his hands? Is not this the carpenter, the son of Mary, and brother of James and Joseph and Judas and Simon? And are not his sisters here with us? And they took offense at him. Jesus lived such an ordinary life growing up that no one believed. In fact, they were offended by how extraordinary he turned out to be. Even as we learn about who James was, we are reminded about who Jesus was and is. Jesus is fully God, but the story of James reminds us that Jesus also lived fully as a human. And there is something comforting, isn't there? In the fact that so much of the ordinary human life that we experience with its bumps and scrapes and bruises, Jesus also experienced. In fact, I think it's more than comforting, it's redemptive. It's redemptive that so much of the ordinary human life that we live every day is the same ordinary human life that Jesus lived in his day. Jesus' ministry of redemption didn't start at the cross, it started the day he was born. And every day of of ordinary human life that Jesus lived gives significance and, and a purpose to the responsibilities and details of the ordinary human life that we now live every day. We do chores, Jesus did chores. We get tired, Jesus got tired. We get hungry and thirsty, Jesus got hungry and thirsty. Second thing we should note... The fact that the Gospels, which means the books of the Bible that tell us the story of Jesus' life, the fact that the Gospels are so transparent about the flaws and embarrassing details of James and all the other early leaders of the church is actually evidence for the authenticity and trustworthiness of the Gospels. We, saw it, we just saw it just now. The Gospels tell us that James and the rest of Jesus' family rejected and discredited Jesus. The Gospels tell us that another leader, Peter, denied Jesus and uh, generally had some really public failures and said some really foolish things. And it wasn't just these two. Actually, the Gospels tell us that all the disciples, what did they do when Jesus was arrested? They ran away. (laughs) They abandoned him. In fact, when he said, even just before that, when, when he was saying that his he is deeply troubled and asked them to wait and pray with him. What did they do? They fell asleep. <laughs> All of these people, James, Peter, the rest of the disciples, they became the first leaders of the early church. And some of them, in fact, had a hand in writing of the, of the Gospels. And the point is this. If the Gospels were just made up, surely they wouldn't have painted their leaders in such an unflattering light. It's Propaganda 101. Don't know if you had that class in school. (laughs) Don't undermine the credibility of the leaders of your movement. Hide imperfections. Explain away mistakes. Airbrush the narrative. But that's not what the gospel writers do, do they? They don't try to hide their mistakes. They don't try to recast themselves in a more positive light because their priority wasn't to make themselves look good. It was to tell the truth about the only one who is good. Their priority wasn't to shine the spotlight on themselves. It was to shine the spotlight on their saviour. Even if it meant showcasing their failures. The honesty of the Gospels is compelling evidence for their reliability. Third thing to note, even as you read the embarrassing details of James' past mistakes, notice how nothing in James' past disqualified him. Nothing in James' past disqualified him from becoming part of the family of God and even from becoming one of the pillars of the church. We've already seen that James had a dark past. It's in these pages for us to read about. Everyone knew that James was the James, the brother of Jesus James, the James who rejected Jesus and said all those nasty things about Jesus. 
And you know what? That's just what people knew from the outside. Jesus knew so much more than what other people knew because Jesus didn't just know James from the outside, Jesus knew James from the inside. Jesus lived with James in the same household and so you could be sure, Jesus knew all the details, all the dirt that only family members could know from living with each other day in and day out, Jesus knew. More than anyone else, Jesus knew all of James's dirty little secrets, but none of that disqualified James from being part of the family of God and even becoming one of the pillars of Jesus' church. You know why? None of that disqualified James because Jesus' grace was sufficient to cleanse and purify and free James from the weight of his past and who he used to be. That's why James's letter bears the unmistakable signs of someone who has been utterly humbled by Jesus' transformational grace. Let's just look at one example, 4 verse 6. James writes this, but God gives more grace. Therefore, it says, God opposes the proud but gives grace to the humble. <clears throat> Submit yourselves, therefore, to God. Resist the devil and he will flee from you. Draw near to God and he will draw near to you. Cleanse your hands, you sinners, and purify your hearts, you double-minded. Be wretched and mourn and weep. Let your laughter be turned to mourning and your joy to gloom. Humble yourselves before the Lord and he will exalt you. James doesn't just write about God's grace. He writes as a sinner who himself has tasted of and has been saved by God's grace. And so we can see in these verses, James's utter confidence in God's grace. He's, look, let's look at it again. But God gives more grace. Therefore, it says, God opposes the proud but gives grace to the humble. Next line, draw near to God and He will draw near to you. And last line, humble yourselves before the Lord and He will exalt you. James isn't writing as someone who is just talking about something in abstract. He's writing as someone who is tasted and knows for sure that God's grace is sufficient. That's why learning about who James is and who James was is so precious because James's story is not too different from our own, is it? Like James, we don't have it together. Like James, Jesus knows all of our dirty little secrets. Not just the things that everyone else knows about from the outside, but all the humiliating and shameful things that no one else knows about. Jesus is not just seeing into our household, he can see into our hearts and our minds, and our thoughts that we would be horrified if anyone else could hear or see. But like James, Jesus' grace is sufficient to cleanse us and purify us and free us from the weight of our past and who we used to be. James was a sinner saved by grace. And you know what? You can be too. <laughs> Even as we ask ourselves who James was, we are called to ask ourselves who we are. And the grace of the gospel means that we are freed from the weight of our imperfections, but more than that, we are freed to be open about our imperfections. It's not pride and the appearance of perfection and having everything together that gets us into God's kingdom. It's humility. And repentance, painful repentance, acknowledging that we are totally dependent on God's grace because we are not perfect. And we don't have everything together. And apart from God's grace, we would totally be lost. So you know what? You don't have to go around pretending that you're perfect. You don't have to go around being anxious about what other people think of you. Because God's grace is sufficient. God's grace isn't for the deserving. God's grace is exclusively for the undeserving. And the beacon of God's grace shines brightest and most glorious when held up against the reality of the darkness of our sin and our shame. 
The story of God's power to save isn't written with our successes, it's written with our failures. It's not written with the successes we boast of, it's written with our sins and our dirty little secrets that we are ashamed of. Christ City, there is no cancel culture in heaven. There is no cancel culture in the church. No one is beyond the reach of God's grace and no one is beyond God's power to save. Not James, not Peter, not any of the disciples and certainly not any of us. Not me and not you. And we need to be reminded of that, don't we? in the way we treat ourselves and in the way we treat others. God's grace is sufficient for us. And so, you know what? We can have grace for ourselves. And we must learn to extend that same grace, always extend that same grace to everyone else in a day and age when we're so focused on posturing ourselves in making sure that we associate ourselves with the right people and distance ourselves from the wrong people, we need to be reminded there is no cancel culture in heaven. No sin is too great. No person is ever too far gone to be beyond the reach of God's grace and power to save. As hard as James's heart was, there was a moment when his heart melted. And he repented of his sins. As, as blind as he was, there was a moment when his eyes were opened to see Jesus for who Jesus truly was, not just his brother, but his Lord and his Savior. We don't know exactly when that moment was, but we know that Jesus' re resurrection was a part of it. Because after Jesus was crucified on that cross and was raised a new life, he spent time with a few different people, and one of those people he spent with was James. 1 Corinthians 15 verse 5. He, meaning Jesus, appeared to Cephas, then to twelve, then to the twelve. Then he appeared to more than five hundred brothers at one time, most of whom are still alive, though some have fallen asleep. Then he appeared to James. Then to all the apostles. We don't know how James felt when Jesus was crucified on that cross, or how he felt when Jesus' lifeless body was laid in that tomb. But there was a moment when the resurrected Jesus appeared before his brother, and oh, what I would give to be a fly on the wall <laughs> for those precious moments when the risen Jesus appeared before his brother who once resented him and rejected him and said all those horrible things about him. I wonder what they spoke about. Maybe, maybe they talked as siblings to talk to each other. Maybe they reminisced about old times. <laughs> Remember when mom used to do that? <laughs> Remember when we used to? But I'm sure they was, most of the time was spent talking about the elephant in the room. Jesus, you're alive. But how? But, but why? Oh, you're alive. That means what you said about yourself, is, it must be true. I can't believe I said all those things. Everything has changed, hasn't it, if you are alive? The resurrection is what changed everything for James, going from rejecter of Jesus to follower of Jesus, from opponent of Jesus to servant of the Lord Jesus Christ. Look at verse 1 again. James, a servant of God and of the Lord Jesus Christ. James was entirely entitled to boast of his credentials as the brother of Jesus. That's not what he says. He's the servant of Jesus. And not just the servant of Jesus, the servant of the Lord Jesus Christ. And when James calls Jesus the Lord Jesus Christ, we need to sit up and pay attention to that. Because the words Jesus is Jesus' name, but Lord and Christ, they're not part of Jesus' name. They're not in his birth certificate. They are titles given to Jesus to declare who Jesus is. 
Lord meaning He is God, Christ meaning He's the promised one who has come to save the world. By proclaiming Jesus as the Lord Jesus Christ, James was testifying that the Jesus he grew up with was God himself. And don't miss how powerful that testimony is. How powerful James' testimony is as someone who grew up in the same household as Jesus. Because even as Jesus knew all of James' dirty little secrets, James would have known all of Jesus' dirty little secrets, if he had any. So I grew up with siblings. And if I tried to start a business today, they might find it within themselves to support me. Maybe buy what I'm selling, maybe even help me tell their friends. But if I tried to start a religion, (laughs) one based completely on my claim to be sinless and perfect, and told them that, by the way, you will definitely suffer and probably be killed, they won't follow me. They'll say, I'm out of my mind, wouldn't they? Because as much as I love my siblings and as much as I think they love me, they know that I'm not perfect. And I know that they know that I am far from perfect. And yet James, brother of Jesus, who grew up in the same household as Jesus, who knew everything there was to know about Jesus. He knew whether Jesus snored. He knew what kinds of food gave Jesus indigestion. That James went from rejecting Jesus to putting his faith in Jesus to becoming a servant of Jesus. And you know what happens in the end? He he dies for Jesus. That James... Went, from all these, went through all these things because he knew that Jesus was exactly who he said he was. The testimony of James is so powerful because he testifies as that Jesus was not just his brother. He testifies that Jesus was the Lord Jesus Christ, God himself, the savior of the world who lived exactly as he claimed to live. The perfect sinless life, who was crucified for our sins and raised to glorious new life. And I think this is a paradigm shift for for many of us. Because for many of us, we've been hardwired to assume that all leaders will eventually fail us. We've been hardwired to assume that no one can ever be as perfect as they claim to be. We just need to wait for the scandal to drop. Not with Jesus. Never with Jesus. James 1.17 Every good gift and every perfect gift is from above, coming down from the Father of lights, with whom there is no variation or shadow due to change. I want to focus on that last phrase. No variation or shadow due to change. We don't have to hold our breath with Jesus. We don't have to hold back. We don't have to have a backup plan just in case Jesus turns out to be a fraud. We don't have to be worried that one day suddenly Jesus will turn out not to be the perfect person he claimed to be. Because with Jesus, there is no variation or shadow due to change. Take this as the testimony of someone who knew Jesus intimately. There's no scandal lurking around the corner. There's no dirty little secret just waiting to be revealed. Christ City, even as we ask the question of who James was, now we need to all answer the question of who Jesus is. Who do you think Jesus is? Who do you think Jesus is? One writer put it this way, Jesus is either liar, lunatic, or Lord. If Jesus is a liar, it's because he said he was God, even though he knew he wasn't. If Jesus is a lunatic, it's because he thought, he he genuinely thought he was God, even though he wasn't. Or he is really Lord. He is really God. He is really who he says he is. Christ City, who do you think Jesus is?
Is he just a moral teacher who was mistaken? Is he just a magician who was someone more than he actually was? Who thought he was someone more than he actually was? Or is he really who he says he is? If this is a question that you're wrestling with, or perhaps you've never thought about, can I invite you to a conversation? No commitment, just conversation. Talk to the person you, you came with. Talk to any of our staff wearing staff lanyards. Or if you want to talk to me, I'll be at the front of the gathering room after the gathering. So first point, who James was. James was a skeptic of Jesus who was transformed by Jesus to become a servant for, of Jesus and eventually became a martyr for Jesus. Even as we ask who James was, we are compelled to ask who Jesus is. So second point, and don't worry, this one is much shorter than the first one. Who we can be. Who we can be. Knowing who James was changes the way we view his writings, isn't it? Because James wasn't just dispensing advice. James was writing as someone who had found wholeness in Jesus and wanted everyone else to experience that same wholeness. That's why in James's letter, we find that he never calls his readers to anything that has not already transformed his life. We saw it just now in chapter 4. James's utter confidence in Jesus' grace comes from the fact that he has tasted of Jesus' grace and his life has been transformed by Jesus' grace. In the coming weeks, we will, we will see how James calls his readers to pursue justice. And even as he does that, you know what he was known as? He was known as James the Just. Even as we will see that he calls us to prayer and fervent prayer, tradition has it that he knelt on his knees in prayer so often that his knees were hard as camels. James was writing as someone who had found wholeness in Jesus and wanted everyone else to experience that wholeness. And that is the theme that unites the entire letter. James's letter has a few themes, and James structures his letter so that he cycles through each of these themes a few times, each time unpacking a theme in a different way, and we're going to see that in the coming weeks. But what we need to start off with today, and what we need to hold on to, is the unifying theme that holds all themes together, and that's the theme of wholeness. One pastor describes this main theme of James this way, the words of Jesus in the voice of wisdom to make us whole. The words of Jesus in the voice of wisdom to make us whole. This letter isn't about instructions to make our lives difficult. It's about guidance to make our lives whole. And it's written with the pastoral urgency and clarity of someone who doesn't want you to make the same mistakes that he did. James has been made whole by God and he wants nothing less for his readers and all of us than the same wholeness that all Christians can have in Christ. And we can trace this theme of wholeness and perfection and completeness throughout the entire letter. Let me give us some examples. 1 verse 4. James writes this, And let steadfastness have its full effect that you may be what? Perfect and complete, lacking in nothing. Trials, James is talking about trials and suffering, which are painful and uncomfortable. But as we shall see in the coming weeks, we can learn to count all trials with joy because trials and suffering, they are part of our journey to what? To wholeness. Let's look at another one. 2 verse 22, you, James writes that you see that faith was active along with his works and faith was completed by his works. Wholeness doesn't come from just saying you have faith. Wholeness comes from a genuine faith that is active and lived out, a faith that works. One last one, 3 verse 2, for we all stumble in many ways and if anyone does not stumble in what he says, he is a perfect whole, complete man, all be able also to bridle his whole body. We need to control our tongue because wholeness is fostered by and manifested in how we talk to each other. Christ, it is so important to pay attention to the book of James is often misunderstood because we don't get what it's actually about. 
The book of James is often misunderstood because we think James is imposing on us expectations of change that are impossible, that he's setting us up for a lifetime of failure and inadequacy. But that's not what James is about. James isn't setting us up for failure. He's giving us a roadmap to wholeness. James isn't setting us up for failure. He's giving us a roadmap to wholeness, a wholeness that is already ours as new creations in Christ. 1 verse 17 to 18 is key to understanding the whole letter. Let me read it out for us again. Every good and perfect, every good gift and every perfect gift is from above, coming down from the Father of lights, with whom there is no variation or shadow due to change. Of his own will, he brought us forth by the word of truth, that we should be a kind of first fruits of his creatures. There is a lot more to be unpacked in the coming weeks, but as we end, notice just two things from these verses. Firstly, the theme of wholeness and perfection continues. But secondly, notice how God doesn't just give us a roadmap to wholeness. God himself is the means to our wholeness. Of his own will, he brought us forth by the word of truth. It is only by God's will and his word that we are made whole. That we should be a kind of first fruits of his creatures. Wholeness is not found in ourselves, it's found in Christ, in the new creation that Christ has made us to be. And that's what James is writing about. He has tasted of that wholeness through Jesus, his brother. And so he writes to us so that we too might find that wholeness as Jesus, our brother. Are you hurting? Come to the healer. Are you dry? Come to the fountain. Do you feel broken? Come to the only one who can make you whole. If you're able, please stand as you respond to God's word together.